Good afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we're live for an hour each weekday afternoon taking your calls. If you have questions about the Bible or the Christian faith or have a difference of opinion from the host, we welcome you to call this number, 844-484-5737. And unlike most days uh, or many days, I can say that our lines are not full at this point. So if you call now, you will be able to get in, hopefully, and uh, much better chance than if you call later. The number again is 844-484-5737. I just have to announce a couple things coming up next Saturday, which only occur once a month. They are in Southern California. Uh, one is a Saturday morning men's Bible study, 8 o'clock in Temecula. And uh, the other one is a, an evening uh, gathering in Buena Park, where each, each month we try to take a different book of the Bible, and I give a, uh, an introduction and overview of each of the book. And this, uh, this month we'll come up to the book of Titus. So uh, that's happening this Saturday night and the men's Bible study in the morning. If you are in Southern California or will be and want to join us, you simply need to go to thenarrowpath.com and look under announcements, you'll, you'll find the time and place of these events. Or, of course, if you're already familiar with the time and place of these events, uh, you can just show up. That's, again, this coming Saturday, something we do uh, the third Saturday of each month. All right, we're going to go to the phones, and we're going to talk to Carrie from Texas. Carrie, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Steve, I've got a couple questions today. Okay. First of all... Uh, John the Baptist, his diet is said to consisted of locusts and wild honey. But wasn't locusts a forbidden food? No, it actually was not. Uh, in the Leviticus chapter, uh, what is it, 17, it talks about that. Uh, it talks about the different uh, clean and unclean animals. Almost all insects are considered to be unclean, except for the hopping ones, the ones that have a rear... Uh, apparatus, their back legs stick up above their backs. That's what it says, you know. And so uh, a grasshopper, a locust, a cricket, um, th those uh, rare, rare uh, species of insects that have that particular means of locomotion actually are within the realm of the clean animals, which is, sets them apart from almost all other insects, which are almost all unclean. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next thing is uh, progressive revelation. It, are the teachings of Christ subject to progressive revelation, or should we consider those teachings the final revelation? Uh, the, the teachings of Christ, you say? Yes. Okay. Uh, they are the uh, ultimate revelation. Uh, by the way, let me just say about your previous question. I just decided to look it up and make sure, and I was wrong. It was It's chapter 11 of Leviticus. Leviticus 11. I think I had said 17 or something like that. Okay, so, um, yeah, as far as progressive revelation goes, what it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, is that God, at sundry times, in times past, spoke to our fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, and it says his son is the express image of his person and the bright shining of his glory, which is a way of saying he, he's the ultimate. The ultimate revelation from God is in Christ. Um, you know, he's not just another prophet. He's the son himself who has come as the exact expression of the father. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that what Jesus said or revealed while he was here is entirely the last word that he will say, because in the New Testament, we have the gifts of the Spirit, including the gift of prophecy, where Jesus actually is known to have spoken uh, through the prophets. He spoke through Agabus, for example. Uh, we find that Philip's four daughters were prophetesses. We know that, uh, you know, though Paul was not what we call a prophet, he received visions of Christ, and Christ spoke to him. Now, this is all after Jesus had come back to heaven. So to say that Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God doesn't mean that there can't be any ongoing revelation from him, but it wouldn't be superior. It wouldn't be, it certainly wouldn't outrank uh, what he said here on earth. It would be totally in, in harmony with it. Um, 
you know, whereas uh, Jesus' teaching would outrank anything either the law or the prophets said. Now, of course, he didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets. He came to fulfill them. But obviously, in fulfilling them, uh, he, he brought an end to some of the practices of the law. And that being so, uh, the, we, we do what he says, not what the law says, because he's the, he's the more lofty, the more complete revelation. Now, anything that Christ might communicate to the church through his spirit ever since his ascension uh, would ne never, uh, you know, be able to contradict or outrank anything Jesus said on earth. It's the same Jesus, and he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, so he's not going to change his mind about anything. So I would say uh, Jesus is the ultimate revelation, though that doesn't mean that the words he spoke when he was here are the only things that we could possibly have from him, because, again, we do find in the book of Acts that he continues to speak uh, through prophets and, and so forth. Thank you, Steve. Okay, Carrie. Thanks for your call. Good talking to you. Our next caller is Brad from Idaho. And Brad, I know you were on the waiting to get on on Friday, but we just ran out of time. We had too many callers. How you doing, Brad? Oh, pretty good. Um, haven't talked to you in a long time. I know it's because I, I not because I didn't want to. It's just I've been uh, busy doing other things. But but I have been listening to you. Now, yesterday, I mean Friday, you said something that really frustrates me. Actually, and so I want to comment on two things, and have and, and they're actually questions at the same time. Okay. But you say that that government has never changed a poor nation to a rich one. Now I have two two aspects of that, but the, I guess my first my two two questions on that particular thing. Then I have another question on where you say that you know Christians at the same time you said Christians take on poverty in a more nuanced program. But on this first thing, me and you have known each other for pushing 25 years. And you've always told me that you don't pay attention to things like government. So why so what, you, what I said 25 you, years ago, yeah, if I wasn't paying attention to government 25 years ago, uh, that means I wouldn't be a quarter of a century later paying attention to government? That, that, that doesn't okay, seem well, very inconsistent to me. No, I'm saying I've listened to you for 25 years straight yeah. in a row. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not big on it. I'm not big on government. But I do know this, that uh, I don't know what I said on Friday, but, but if I, uh, I, don't, I think you paraphrased it wrong, that no government ever, what, raised people out of poverty or something like that. I would say okay, here's, no government programs, no social programs govern that the government has uh, put in place have raised people out of poverty. Right. So that's exactly what I'm talking about. So, um, well, my qu I have two questions on that on that particular statement, and I and the first one I already said. It seems to me like you have told me for I've told everybody, but me personally also that you don't really want to study government. So um, the other thing is is uh, what about like China right now? China has pulled about almost a billion people out of poverty in the past 20 years, actually about 25 years right now. And, and Russia's done almost the same thing, except way less people. And, and, and our, gov our government pulled a whole bunch of people out of poverty during the Great Depression. So what, what, do, you, so what do you think about that? I guess well, I, okay, my, my position is that no government policy uh, will bring people out of poverty uh, uh, through social programs. Now, I will say this. If the, if the programs that were before the government instituted their programs were worse, for example, if there was uh, oppressive dictatorships or something like that that simply stole people's money and made people poor, then, yeah, I could see, you know, that could be improved. That could be improved. I'm talking about a, uh, in contrast to a free market. In, in contrast to no government interference at all, is in my opinion, uh, it is that system. The less government you have, I believe, the more you're going to see people brought out of poverty. Okay, so so you believe, which like most people believe, but I don't, but most people in America, but not around the world, in this false, because it is a false thing called free market. And so... Um, 
Okay, so I understand that. But, I, you know, what I would want you to do is look at what free market actually really means. But we'll, we'll, we'll skip that. That was a great answer. But I, I understand that you're, you're not understanding what, what the actual meaning of a free market is. Now, the other thing you said was... Well, let me just tell you what I mean by it. Let me tell you, if I'm not using the term the way you would, let me just let you know what I'm using it to mean. What I'm using it to mean is that the government does not interfere in uh, commerce. Although it does, of course, prosecute crimes of commerce, obviously, because that's what the government is supposed to do. The government's supposed to uh, maintain, uh, you know, criminal justice system. And so, if somebody is uh, doing uh, corrupt, uh, exploitative, or, or deceptive business practices, uh, that's fraud. You know, that's a crime. I'm, you know, the government should interfere with fraud. I'm just talking about in terms of the government allowing people to sell their stuff, make their stuff, do their stuff, buy their stuff, and uh, and, uh, and and letting people take responsibility for their own uh, finances. Because the only way the government can do something other than that is to take money from people's earnings and distribute it to somebody else. Uh, you know, it, what I'm talking about is let people earn their money and let them do what they want with their money. That's what the Bible actually presents. That's why the Bible says, do not covet what your neighbor has. Don't, don't steal from your neighbor. Why? Because your neighbor has things that are lawfully his, and they're not lawfully yours, and they don't lawfully belong to the government either. So the government can't take them without it being theft, uh, un unless they are doing so to provide a service that the government is authorized by God to provide, like criminal justice system. So that's my position of free market, okay. simply the so government, not Take so would you, consider, would you consider Ronald Reagan bringing in a free market? You know, I don't know. That's back when Ronald Reagan was in office. I, I liked him, by the way, but I didn't know much about politics. Uh, and I can't really evaluate his administration. I was, I was young enough that I wasn't interested in politics back then. Okay. So let me ask you another question. I mean, let me, I, I don't want to go on and on, but you said that government has to have, has to tax, take from other people. Well, for 3,000 years, Stephen, this is documented history. Government has the right under God to create money out of thin air. So, and, and, and for 3,000 years, we have proof of that happening. And even Christ implies that, in my opinion, when he says, render under Caesar, what is Caesar's? So um, this idea that you have that government can only have money by taxing you and me is actually false. But I'll, I'll skip. I don't want to. My, my other question. Well, is but, but, but Brad, before we get to your second question, before you get to your second question, <clears throat> wouldn't you agree, though, that when the government creates paper money out of out of thin air, that it devalues the money, so it actually Absolutely steals from people not. who are holding so it money? It does not do that. Oh, oh it doesn't. Let me explain it doesn't. You why it okay. Doesn't. Can I explain you why it doesn't? Okay. Because if you can if, quickly, if, government, yeah. if governments create money to build bridges and things like this or even fix people from having cancer, they're actually helping society out. So, it's, so it's, it, it balances itself out. Plus, when they build a bridge, they tax the people that are benefiting from that bridge, but they don't tax the people who aren't, are not benefiting from that bridge. So there's a way of... That, that, that's, of only, that's, that's only true of a toll system. bridge. That, that, that's only true of a toll, of a toll bridge. No, no, a toll bridge is a privately owned bridge. I'm talking okay. about, let's say that okay, you have let's... a piece of property that's close to a bridge. And, I'll tell and you what, my lines that... are full, so instead of arguing, I'll give I'm... you your point. I'll give you your so point. What's your, second, what's your second point? Yeah. Um, when you say that Christianity has a more nuanced program to find out why people are homeless and poor, and then at the yep. same time you'd say that government can't fix that problem by saying that government has never changed the nation from poor to rich by, by programs. Well, what I'm, wanna, what I'm asking you isn't studying government and studying government's programs part of the Christian's duty at looking at the nuances of why people are poor. Well, if people want to study that, they can. I, I study the Bible and I find out what is ethical and what's not ethical. And, and I study ethical. the Bible also, and I believe okay. that it's ethical okay. to also be part of the government. And you, and you apparently don't. I think it's very important. Well, I'm not, for wait, wait, I'm not, uh, wait, I'm not saying I'm not saying Christians can't be part of the government. That's not my position. My position is that the no agency 
has the right to take from another person his earned income unless he's going to provide uh, an agreed upon exchange of, of goods or services. In other words, if, uh, if you want to mow my lawn and you want me to give you 20 bucks and I say, okay, I'll do that because we've agreed on something. I'm getting something and you're getting something. Now, if the government says, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide for you a public school. I don't care that you don't want it. I'm going to provide it anyway. And you have to pay for it. I'm going to tax you for it. That's a service I'm providing for you. Well, they can, they can do that, but it's unethical because I didn't ask to buy that. They're taking money for a good or service I have no interest in and, no, and do not have any, see any value in. There's many government services like that. Now, when it comes to the government taking money from a, an earner and saying, now we're going to take this money, we're going to give it to uh, these homeless people here or, or the, these, uh, these single moms here who keep getting pregnant so they can live on the dole. Uh, we're going to do that with it. I would say, well, listen, I, I'm, not a, I'm not opposed to helping homeless people. I'm not opposed to helping single mothers. But I'm not sure the government knows how to help them. Handing them money isn't working. That's what's been going on. The government can do that. The government can hand people money. Although the government, in order to do that, has to take money from somebody else. And that person who it was taken from may not agree that that's the person they want the money they earned to be given to. Because, like I said, the Christian uh, concern about poverty is more nuanced. We might say, well, here's a person who's uh, poor, but every time people give him money, he goes out and buys drugs with it. Uh, you know, you give enough money to rent an apartment, to buy a car, to have a cell phone. But, uh, you know, he doesn't take care of the car. He crashes the car. He, he spends the money on drugs, and he's out begging for more money again. Uh, you know, now, if that's the case with a person, then I would rather take the money that I can give to the poor and not give it to that person because I'm not going to end his poverty. His lifestyle and his choices are creating his poverty, not the, abs not the absence of money. It's his choices that are making him poor. So I'd rather find somebody whose choices are not making them poor, but they really need some money. Maybe they're working, uh, you know, uh, the working poor, or maybe they're uh, disabled. Or they have a lot of kids and, and the mother's staying at home with the kids and the husband doesn't make enough. I'd much rather help people like that because they're not, they're not wasting the money. And they actually, I think, uh, deserve some help. So the point is that when the government takes your money and gives it to who they think is a good charity, if you're a Christian, you're not gonna, hopefully you're not going to agree that using your tax money to give sex changes to military people and even now to uh, illegal immigrants, uh, to, to use your money for spending tens of thousands of dollars to give sex changes to these people, you might think, you know, I'd rather take that money and give it to someone who I think is more deserving. And uh, that's why I believe that the government cannot morally take your money and give it to other well, people. They don't know who not, you want to give it to. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the average person who is hardworking. So in America, we have a real big problem with hardworking people like myself with a bunch of kids who are flat broke. And it's specifically because of government programs that are actually stealing our money from us, and it isn't taxation. It okay. Is well, listen, we've gone, tw we've gone 20 minutes together, Brad, and we haven't really come to an agreement. But you've, you've had a chance to share your thoughts, and, uh, and you're always welcome to do that. But it sounds to me like you're making my point. But in any case, because I'm against those government programs that are taking your money. So, but anyway, uh, I appreciate you calling. You've had uh, two questions. We've talked 10 minutes each on them, and uh, we've got a lines full. So I hope you'll allow me to move on. Well, I'm not right. saying government programs take your money. I'm saying they steal money. They allow Okay, uh, you, you apparently didn't hear what I said, okay? But we'll talk again, I'm sure. I'm sure we'll talk again. Uh, but when I say it's time f to end the call, that doesn't mean start a new conversation. I told you my lines are full. Okay, let's talk to... Um, Jim from Staten Island, New York. Jim, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, Steve. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, I would like to speak, uh, give a few verses concerning faith, which is key to salvation. In 2 Thessalonians 3, 2, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Hebrews eleven six. without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Ephesians 3.12 
in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Him is a personal, possessive pronoun. And it's referring to the previous verse. It's him is Christ Jesus, our Lord. So the point that I'm trying to make, and also two more verses. Philippians 1.29, for unto you it is given not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. So to believe it's given to a person. In Acts 16, when the Philippian jailer, when he thought his life was on the line because he, the prisoners escaped, he was going to kill himself. Now, uh, Paul said, don't kill do yourself any harm. We're all here. Then he springs into the, into the prison and says, what must I do to be saved? That's the effect of salvation. He didn't say, what must I do to be regenerated? He didn't say, what must I do to be born again? He said, what must I do to be saved? That is to be kept, transported, made whole. He believed he needed salvation first. He, the first thing somebody does when they're regenerated is cry out to God, like the thief on the cross, like the, in Luke 18, you know, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the effect, the cause is God sends the spirit of his son into the heart, the new heart of a person, with his faith, which is the fruit of the spirit. The spirit comes in, and now they cry out for salvation. Now they believe the gospel. Now they believe that they need a savior. Now that they, they can see that, and in John, one more verse, in John 16, Jesus said, he's going to send the company, he's going to convict the world of of. of How's it go? Judgment? Sin, righteousness, and judgment, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, sin because they do not believe on me. Yeah. Uh, an unbeliever has an unregenerate heart, and it's foolishness to them. Okay, well, I certainly let you give your laundry list of scriptures, and, and I know I'm never going to change you from your Calvinism, because you call me all the time with Calvinist proof text. I would like to uh, recommend to you that you listen to my series on this subject, because I deal with those scriptures. And I deal with this subject at great length, and uh, certainly much more length than I can do on a phone call at this program, justly. Um, but I will say this, uh, what, for those who are listening and don't understand what you're saying, uh, Jim is a Calvinist, and Calvinists believe that if you are not born again, you cannot believe. The non-Calvinist believes that if, you're, if you do not believe, you cannot be born again. Now, it might sound like so many words, but no, this is the question. Calvinists believe that you can't believe unless you are first regenerated by God. Uh, of course, none of the verses that Jim quoted say that, but, but that's the Calvinist belief, that you first have to be regenerated, and then you can believe, because until, until you're regenerated, you're dead in trespass and sins, and dead to them means you can't do things like believe. I'm not sure why they think dead means that. That's not what the word dead means in Scripture, or even, even when we use the word dead literally. It doesn't mean you can't make that kind of decisions. If someone's literally dead, they can't make any kind of decisions. But, um, but the Calvinists have just decided arbitrarily that dead in trespass and sins means you're in a spiritual state where you can't believe or repent. Even though, of course, they will admit you can make all kinds of other decisions. But why they would make that arbitrary limitation, say, well, a, a person who's spiritually dead, they can choose their wife, they can choose their career, they can choose their daily habits, they can choose their toothpaste, they can choose their hour of going to bed at night, uh, and they can choose their home, but they can't choose whom they will follow. Uh, now, to me, that's just made up out of whole cloth. Uh, and I don't believe dead in trespass and sins means that. But because they do believe that, they say, well, clearly, if you're dead in trespass and sins, you can't repent and you can't believe, because those are the very definitions that they give to uh, dead in trespass and sins, which means they're winning the argument by defining the terms. But they don't have the right to define terms, because those terms don't mean that. <laughs> The, the prodigal son, when he was away from his father, is said to have been dead and lost. His father said, my son was dead and now he's alive. He's lost and now he's found. But when he was dead and lost, he made a decision to come back to his father and, uh, and be restored. So uh, there's nothing in the Bible that says that being dead in the figurative sense means you can't make a decision to come back uh, to your father. And, and so... Anyway, Calvinism says you, you have to be regenerated first, and that's what Jim's arguing here. You can't believe unless God gives it to you as a gift, You can't unless he brings you back to life. Okay, 
the biblical doctrine, which was always the biblical doctrine until Augustine invented what we call Calvinism, is that people are saved by believing. They are regenerated by believing. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus when, G when he said, you have to be born again. And Nicodemus says, how can this be? He said, well, as Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness, so also the Son of Man should be lifted up that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Just like the serpent, they had to look at the serpent, then they could be healed. If you believe in Jesus, then you'll have eternal life. So uh, actually the Bible never says one word about the need to be regenerated before you believe. And the verses that Jim gave our favorite Calvinist text because they talk about God giving faith. Some of them do, not all of them do. Some of them aren't very good Calvinist texts, but a few of them are. But God can give faith to those who want faith. The Bible doesn't say they have to be born again before they can want faith. Uh, remember the man who said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. That man chose to believe, but he did need help. He wanted God to increase his faith. Uh, listen, I need to take a break, but I appreciate your call, Jim. Thanks for joining us. We've got another half hour coming up. So don't go away. Our lines are full, so we'll be talking to a lot of people in the next half hour. You're listening to The Narrow Path. We are listener supported. You can write to us at The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593, or at our website, thenarrowpath.com. I'll be right back. Steve Gregg has written a number of highly favorably reviewed books which you can find at your online booksellers, including Amazon and Barnes & Noble. His books are Revelation, Four Views, Hell, Three Christian Views, and the two-volume work on the Kingdom of God called Empire of the Risen Sun. Find them by searching the name Steve Gregg at Amazon or other booksellers. Welcome back to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and uh, we're live for another half hour taking your calls. It looks like our lines are full, uh, but if you want to try a little later in the half hour to get through with your question about the Bible or the Christian faith or your disagreement with the host, we always welcome those. The number to call is 844-484-5737. And our next caller is Slavic from South Carolina. Welcome to the Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, Steve. Hi. Uh, I got a question. Hi. I got a question about uh, Genesis uh, twenty-two twelve. Um, it's in the account of Abraham about to bring his son Isaac, you know, a sacrifice, and uh, when he stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son, uh, it says, "But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham." So he said, uh, "Here I am," and he said, "Do not lay your." hand on the lad or do anything to him for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son your only son from me um, just um, I guess just a question <laughs> I guess this is referring to uh, you know God's knowledge his omniscience and, and foreknowledge is it right. is it uh, I mean, it's a necessity for a Christian to believe that God is omniscient or um, and also does this verse show us that God may not have foreknowledge of every every uh, meticulous uh, detail uh maybe due to god giving us free will that he would supposedly have this uh quote-unquote limitation or would this be considered a, a heretical belief uh, what are your thoughts on on this or, or does this yeah. verse not say that at all yeah yeah this verse this verse is one of the favorites of uh that i've heard from uh people who believe in openness theology now you ask is that a heresy i don't think it's a heresy uh, some people would call it that only because it's different than their theology, but the Bible doesn't say anywhere that that belief is heresy. Um, the idea is uh, it's a different view of time than most Christians hold. Most Christians hold that God knows the future for one of two reasons. Calvinists believe that God knows the future because he's ordained everything that's going to happen. So he doesn't learn anything from us doing things. Like he, he, he wouldn't learn anything about Abram by Abram offering his son because whatever Abram did, God ordained it would happen before Abram was born and God knew it was going to happen. That's the Calvinist view of God's foreknowledge. But 
uh, Arminian view of the foreknowledge of God is that God knows all things, though he doesn't ordain all things, that many things are left to free will, and even though we are the ones fully making the decision about it, God knows before we do it what we will do. And um, those who take this view, uh, or people who often take the view of C.S. Lewis and others before him, who believe that God lives outside of time, that we live within a, uh, a realm called time, where one thing happens after another, there's past and there's present and future, but they say God lives outside of that whole realm of time. He created time and space, and, uh, and therefore he's outside of time and space, he's uh, transcendent to it. And they say in his timeless state, he, you know, past, present, and future are all simultaneous. And therefore, what we call our future is really just, uh, he, he doesn't have future and past. He just, it's all one eternal now. That's what Arminianism usually teaches, that God is outside of time. Now, the Bible doesn't say that either. It doesn't say that God ordains all things like the Calvinist says. And it doesn't say that God is outside of time. These are just different ways of people trying to explain how it is that God could know the future. And then, of course, the openness theology is the view that uh, he doesn't really know all the future. But they say that's not because God is not omniscient. Omniscient means that God knows all things. The Bible says that God knows all things. It doesn't say he's omniscient because the word omniscient doesn't appear in the Bible, but that's what omniscient refers to, the fact that God knows all things. But they would say future things that have not been decided yet are not things. They don't exist. Uh, the choice I will make five minutes from now does not yet exist. Unless, of course, it's determined. You know, you know secular, uh, you know, atheistic determinism would say that, you know, the choices I'll make five minutes from now or, or five years from now are going to happen because of the way that the atoms are bumping against each other in my head right now. And one thing leads to another. It's all a big chain reaction. And it leads to, uh, you know, whatever I'm going to do in the future is a result of what's you know, physically going on in my head right now. I don't believe that either. But, but the idea is that openness theology would teach that the future does not exist. There's nothing there. There's no content. God knows everything, but the future is not a thing. Uh, it's empty until it happens. And therefore, they would say God is not outside time, and God does not ordain all that happens. And therefore, God cannot really know everything that, that uh, I'm going to do until I do it. Now, uh, they would have some caveats that. They would say, well, God certainly knows what he's going to do. So a lot of the future things, he, of course, he knows certainly are going to happen because he's going to do them. And that's why the prophets could speak as they did about things God was going to do, and he did them. They knew because God knows what he's going to do. Uh, they would say also he knows, of course, the kinds of things that, that the laws of nature produce, like he knows what position all the stars will be in a million years from now in the sky because they're following the laws of nature. And frankly, a supercomputer could make the same determination. They, he, they also would say that he often does have a very strong, uh, you know, hunch or knowledge of what people are going to do based on knowledge of their character. They would say, for example, the reason Jesus knew that Peter was going to deny him three times before the cock crows is not because Jesus had absolute foreknowledge uh, about the future, but that he had absolute knowledge of Peter, knew that what Peter would do, knew how Peter would respond in those cases. So in other words, people who hold to openness theology, they don't say God doesn't know anything in the future. He knows all the things in the future that can be known because they're determined, but he doesn't know things that haven't been determined yet, and those choices we're going to make are going to be determined by us. That's the openness view. Now, I don't, I don't hold that view. When I first heard it, oh, 40 years ago or so, or over 40 years ago, I thought of it as a, a heresy because I'd never heard anything like it. I thought it was saying that God doesn't have all knowledge, and therefore it was compromising his omniscience. As I got to understand the people and the way they explain it since then, I realized that, no, they're not saying God doesn't have all knowledge. He does know everything. They're just saying that some things don't exist. There are things that don't exist and therefore can't be known only because there's no information content to know. And, uh, you know, that's, they, I would say the openness theology has some, some scriptures that they would find difficult to explain, but so do the other views. So I don't, uh, you know, nothing in the Bible says you have to have this or that particular view of the omniscience of God or the foreknowledge of God to be saved. 
So, you know, a Christian could hold that view, and many, many Christians do, an increasing number do. Now, on this particular thing where Abram was told to sacrifice his son, and when he was about ready to do it, God said, don't do it, because now I know that you fear me. This is one of those things I've, uh, there's quite a few verses of this kind in the Old Testament where God acts or speaks as if he doesn't know something uh, until it happens. And this is some of the kind of material that leads people to reach the openness view. The problem with that is that these kinds of statements are not only made about things that would suggest God didn't know the future, but quite a few of the same kind of statements would suggest God doesn't even know the present. For example, when, when God came to the garden after Adam and Eve sinned and said, Adam, where are you? And Adam said, I'm in the bushes. I was naked and I didn't want you to see me. God said, how did you know you were naked? Did, you, you didn't uh, eat that fruit, did you? I mean, God's acting like he doesn't know something, but it's not the future he's acting like he doesn't know. It's the present. When he met with Cain after Cain killed Abel, God said, Cain, where's your brother? And Cain said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? But of course, God did know where his brother was. In fact, he said so. I know where he is. His blood cried out to me from the ground that received his, from your hand. And so, I mean, God often speaks as if he doesn't know something. When he's going down to check on the Tower of Babel, God says within himself, let's go down and see this thing, what they're doing, you know. And uh, like, like God can't know it unless he comes down and sees it. I mean, these are what we call anthropomorphic uh, things. God is speaking as if he's a person when he really isn't. He's actually coming down, condescending to our level to speak to us as if he is on our level. After all, the very appearance of God in a human form is a condescension, and he does that a number of times in the Bible. So the idea, it's, it's anthropomorphic, God speaking as if he's a man. Now, for example, when he says uh, he's on his way to Sodom, to destroy Sodom, and he's walking with Abram, God says, shall I hide from Abram what I'm about to do? He says, Abram, I've heard really bad things about Sodom and Gomorrah. I heard it's really bad down there. I'm going down to see it, and if it's that bad, I'll know it. He acts like he doesn't know it, but he's not talking about the future. He's talking about the present. He doesn't know how bad things are a few blocks down the road. Come on. I mean, God certainly knows all that. So when God says, now I know that you fear me, actually, even that is not saying I didn't know the future. He said, I didn't know what was in your heart. I didn't know the present. That, God, that Abraham feared God was a reality before he offered Isaac, and it's, that's the reason he did. And God says, now I know that you fear me. Well, didn't God know that Abram feared him before that? And years earlier still? Well, this is God talking as if he's one of us. Like I said, it's God condescending to speak as a human when he's talking to a human. And uh, you find a lot of that in the Bible. It's not suggesting that God really is limited to uh, the things that people know, and he doesn't know any more than they do. But when he comes and he appears in a human form and talks to people, people he often talks to them as if he's just another guy and uh, that is what I think this particular verse is doing but um, like I said there are people who would say this and other verses of that type sometimes would give the impression that God didn't know the future until it happened and uh, while that's not my view I can understand that people could take it that way and I don't see any reason to call that heretical since there's no bait there's no innate uh, teaching of the Bible that says that you have to be, in order to be a Christian, you have to have a particular view of the uh, foreknowledge of God. There's actually quite a few views of the foreknowledge of God out there. I'm not, like I said, openness is just one of them. So that'd be, that, I mean, uh, you could take it that way. And lots of people I know do, but, but I don't take it that way myself. Because I do believe that God knows the future. Okay, let's talk to Vic from San Clemente, California. Vic, welcome. <coughs> Yeah, hi. This is Dick uh, from San Clemente. And oh, Dick. Steve, I had I had a question um, regarding. I was reading the Bible late last night, and I ran. Um, I think it was in the Book of Luke, and it said that um, if your name is not in the uh, uh, in the Book of Life, <laughs> it's not written in pencil. And I'm thinking, wow. I think it was in the New Living Translation. And I, uh, my name, like I've it. felt, is in the Lamb's Book of Life, <laughs> which means, I'm sure, the Book of Life. The Lamb's well, first of all, I, there's, there's nothing in the Bible that says that your name in the Book of Life is not written in pencil. And I'm not saying that it is written in pencil. I'm just saying 
that it isn't. It, there's no words in the Greek that correspond with the word pencil in right. in our New Testament. So right. uh, it's obvious that if it was the New Living, you sure it wasn't the um, the Message Bible. No, <laughs> no. Okay, in in other words, like it couldn't. It couldn't be erased. Was the theme of the right. little paragraph that I was reading. So I yeah, figured, that's, wow. That's not a translation. Yeah, that's not a translation. Oh, good. No, the, the oh. Bible doesn't. The Bible doesn't have anything like that. Yeah, what is right. what he's yeah, yeah, you know, no. Jesus said that uh, to to one of the churches. He said, if you, um, uh, well, it's, this is what he said to the church of Sardis in yeah. Revelation three, verse five. Uh, he said, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father. So only the overcomers are promised that their name will not be blotted from the book of life. Now, he doesn't actually speak of anyone whose name is, but it seems a ridiculous thing to make that promise to a special group if it actually applies to everybody. You know, nobody's names can be blotted from the book of life. Now, you, your comment on once you're saved, you're always saved, is that the... Um, that's not my position. Yeah, that's that, not my position. No, that's okay. No, I believe I believe the name can be blotted out if you're not an overcomer. Now, what's an overcomer? Well, in the Book of Revelation, the the saints, uh, the Christians, are overcomers. It says they uh, in Revelation twelve eleven they overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So these are people who stayed faithful unto death to Christ. And they're the right. ones who are overcomers. Now, if people right. deny Christ before death, they didn't overcome. They didn't. They didn't. Uh, they didn't win the battles. We're not living in a playground. We're living in a, a battleground here, yeah. and we wrestle. We wrestle against principalities and powers, and and we're told to, you know, fight off the uh, fleshly lusts that war against the soul in First Peter two. Uh, mm -hmm. We're just, uh, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of battle that we're involved in, because there's a war over our soul, and the Bible nowhere says. Well, you could just relax and cruise into heaven because, you know, uh, your enemy will leave you alone if you don't fight back. You know, just don't fight him. Just just relax. Put your feet up. Watch TV. And the devil will just leave you alone. No, the devil, the reason we fight is because the devil's not going to leave us alone. And he has something he hopes to gain. And what he hopes to gain is our souls. Perfect. I really appreciate it. And I prayerfully support your ministry. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dick. Good talking to you, brother. Uh, let's see. We're going to talk to J.C. from Chandler, Arizona next. J.C., welcome. Good afternoon, Steve. It's always a pleasure to speak with you and be on the program. Um, we're blessed and bold as best we can here in Arizona. So Great. my question is, the three amigos, when they walked out of the furnace and Nebuchadnezzar um, said, uh, in essence, I saw a figure like the Son of God. Um, why didn't that stick with Nebuchadnezzar? And do you think it's possible that Jesus makes similar appearances today or since his ascension? Well, there was a fourth person in the fire furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He didn't go in with them, and he didn't come out with them, so he just apparently appeared in there when they were in there. And Nebuchadnezzar did say he, he looks like uh, some, our Bible says the Son of God. Uh, the Hebrew could be rendered a son of the gods because Nebuchadnezzar was a polytheist and was more likely to say something like that. But, but in any case, um, a, a son of God or a son of the gods, he's simply saying he looks like he's superhuman. He looks like he's not just a person. He looks like he's got you know, divine uh, you know, uh, identity or character or, or features or something. Now, this could be an angel. Uh, most Christians I know, myself included, usually refer to this as an instance of what we call a theophany or a Christophany, where, where Jesus himself actually appeared in the fire furnace with them. The Bible doesn't say it is a theophany. And again, Nebuchadnezzar might have said the same things if he'd seen an impressive angel. You know, the angels that stood outside the tomb of Jesus were so impressive that the guards fell down as dead men in front of them. Angels can be pretty intimidating. So, I mean, it may be an angel, uh, or it may be Jesus. It could be a theophany. But uh, we can't really, you know, we can't really say with certainty that this is a case of Jesus. However, you asked, would Jesus ever appear like this in modern times with people who maybe who are martyrs or suffering or whatever? 
I believe Jesus often appears to people who are dying faithful. I've heard many stories of people, uh, including my own, my own grandfather, actually thought he saw Jesus in the room before he died of cancer. Um, and there are, you know, I think Billy Graham said his, his mother or his grandmother, just the moment before she died, she sat up in her bed and said, there's Jesus, and then she was gone. And I've heard lots of stories like that. Heard lots of stories like that. So I think, I think Jesus has often appeared uh, you know, um, with his people uh, when they're suffering or dying. And, uh, you know, I, even if he doesn't appear physically, I believe he's very near in a, in a sensed reality to his people when they're being faithful and to death. Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't rule out that people might actually see him on occasion. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time, Steve, and God bless you. Uh, it's always a pleasure, sir. All right. God bless you, man. Yeah. Yeah, there's, of course, cases uh, we hear from the Arab nations, uh, especially North African nations, I think, where uh, Arab tribes, m Muslim tribes, actually, uh, sometimes a whole village will see Jesus in dreams and so forth, which is maybe a little different than, you know, him appearing at the time of death or time of suffering. But uh, still, uh, that Jesus can appear to people is not to, to be ruled out biblically at all. Nothing in the Bible says he would not. Uh, Jeanette from Houston, Texas, welcome. Hi, thank you for taking the call. Um, sure. Are you so speaking on your speakerphone? Is, Are you using a speakerphone? Um, no, it's the headset. You're not able to hear me? It, well, I can hear you. It's just the real echoey. But go ahead. I think I can understand. Go ahead. Okay. Um, my question is in regards to practical expression of faith. Um, and I believe it's March 4th when Jesus was in the boat and there was a storm. And when they came to him all panicking, talking about, you know, Lord, don't you care that we perish? And he was kind of like, yeah, where's your faith? Mm -hmm. um, so my question since for that is like, I did last night, well, actually this morning I had an incident where I was terrified about something and I was trying to have faith. And it's like, okay, but I'm scared, you know, so how do I have faith? I do believe God can do this right now. This thing is in my face and I got to deal with it. So practically, how are they in the boat? supposed to show things, and even in my instance, how am I supposed to not have that fear and just have this faith? Well, I think you need to, I think we all need to uh, cultivate the kind of relationship with God <clears throat> where we, we fully trust him in every situation. Uh, in other words, Jesus was with them in the boat. Uh, he was asleep in the boat. And the wind and the waves were about ready to sink the boat. At least the disciples thought so. And they were terrified. And they said, Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? And, of course, he rebuked the wind and the waves, and the storm stopped. And he, then he rebuked them for their little faith. I think he was assuming that they should figure, uh, him being who he is, that uh, he would have them in a, uh, he'd have circumstances under control. Uh, he had, in fact, said to them, let's go across the lake. So... He was right. intending to get there. There's no way a storm could stop him if he's intending to get there. Uh, you know, so, I mean, the, the point is that as long as we're obeying Jesus, we don't have to be afraid. Now, on the other hand, I guess they might not have known for sure that this wasn't the way that they were going, that God and Jesus wanted them to die. You know, I mean, they're going to die some way. We know that God wants us to die one way or another because we're going to. Uh, you know, I, the thing is, when you're afraid, I guess when you're afraid, say, what's the worst thing that can happen in this situation I'm afraid of? If the worst thing that can happen is you're going to die, well, then that's not a bad thing. I mean, it's, it's not pleasant to those who survive you and miss you and so forth, but they're going to lose you one way or another. We're all going to lose everybody. Everyone's going to die. But um, the truth is, I'd rather die when God thinks it's the right time for me to than just randomly. Uh, if I felt like this is the moment right now that God wants me to die, I'd say, well, I'm glad to have that knowledge of that, and I'm ready to go. You know, I, I'm ready to go all the time. Uh, if I was told by a doctor I'm going to die within two weeks, I'd think, well, that's excellent to know. Yeah, fantastic. I've always I've been looking forward to it for decades, you know. I want to see Jesus. And I really would. I mean, because I have no doubt. I have no doubt in my mind that if I die, I'm going to see Jesus. And it's actually kind of what I'm, one of the things I'm living for. And uh, I know that I can't die until God decides it's my time. <clears throat> so... That's because I trust him. I trust that he's in charge. Remember, Jesus said, just seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else 
will be taken care of by God. God will, everything will be added to you you need. So you really, you know, having a, a faith relationship with God is uh, just putting everything in his hands, saying, I'm, I have only one responsibility to be concerned about, and that is, am I doing what God wants me to be doing? If I am, all the problems associated with that, the dangers and the challenges and so forth, they're all his problem. That's his problem, not mine. If he wants me to die, well, God knows I'm going to die one way or another. If this is the way he wants me to go, then who am I to complain? You know, I mean, I realize that <clears throat> viscerally we react fearfully when, when it seems like we're in danger. That's a natural thing. Animals do that, too. It's not a sin. Uh, you know, you have a survival instinct. Therefore, if you're driving down the, uh, you know, in a blizzard on the Ohio Turnpike and, and uh, you hit black ice and you're spinning around on the freeway uh, and you can't see the road because it's all covered with snow and everything, uh, you know, when your car stops and slams up against the embankment on the side, you can probably tell I'm speaking from experience here, uh, your yeah. heart's beating in your chest really fast. Now, uh, I can say this. That's a visceral reaction. You know, your body is reacting to the sense, uh-oh, there's danger here. This could be deadly. But once you realize that, like, like I've been in airplanes where there was so much turbulence. I thought you, know, you could look outside and see the wings flapping in the turbulence. I, I, you know, I don't know if this is going to survive. There's, uh, once, uh, there's lightning flashing on all, all sides of the plane about every two seconds. I think, well, you know, we could be hit by lightning. Uh, you know, but, you know, at first it's a little scary. Then I think, oh, well, what's the worst that can happen? Worst that can happen is we crash and I go to be with Jesus. I mean, it's like our visceral reactions are natural. We're, we're, we're actually given those, like animals are, as, as a means of surviving. That when I see, uh, uh, you know, a rabid dog stumbling down the street toward me, I'm, I, uh, I'm fearful enough to get into my house or in my car or get away from it. That's how species survive, by having that instinct. But we also have our rational powers, to, and, and we're supposed to, with those, put our trust in God. And say, okay, I'm in danger. I can do nothing. I, I can do nothing about it in this case. So the only person who can really do anything about it is God. And he may or may not deliver me from this. If he does, then I got nothing to fear. If he doesn't, I've got nothing to fear. Uh, I mean, you got to talk yourself out of it. I knew I had a friend who was had terrible uh, claustrophobia. And, uh, mm. you know, when she would go into an airplane, She'd just feel like she was going to, uh, you know, you know, claw her way out just because she was locked in this plane. And I told her, you know, what's the worst that can happen? I mean, just if you're trusting God, the worst thing that can happen is you can die, right? And is that all that bad? And she began to think that way. And she said later to me that that really helped her. That really helped her. She was able to fly and so forth because she's saying, well, what am I afraid of? Dying? But I'm not really, I'm not afraid to die, you know? So, and, I mean, and, you know, like, I'm not, I'm not afraid to die. In this situation, it's like I'm embarrassed to say it, but it was a, it was a bug. <laughs> it was well, like a two and a half inch. So I'm in Texas, and so we have this huge yeah. of water bugs. I call them roaches. Yeah, they I've seen those. Me. And so I've seen this. they're huge. In Hawaii, we call them it's Kona not. cruisers. I will tell you this: I've been in, the, <laughs> I, I've gone into the shower in Hawaii and seen these Kona cruisers. They're like four inch uh, cockroaches and stuff like that. I've seen them in Japan too. And other places. And I'll tell you, I like to stay my distance from them, too. I mean, I'm not afraid they're going to do anything to me. They are just gross me out. So, I mean, there are reactions. Again, these are visceral reactions. And there's nothing wrong with these visceral reactions. However, when, when we viscerally feel fear, that we need to rationally say, okay, what am I supposed to do about this? And then we should do whatever we should do. If there's nothing we can do about it, we just leave it in God's hands. Say, if I live, I live. If I die, I die. If, if I'm supposed to do something about it to change it, well, then I do that. This is, you know, we just take responsibility and we leave the rest in God's hands. That's the whole idea of living by faith. Hey, I'm out of time. I wish I wasn't. You've been listening to The Narrow Path. Our website is thenarrowpath.com. Thanks for joining us. Sponsored by The Narrow Path. You can join Steve Gregg every week afternoon at 2 o'clock here on True Talk 800. Coming up next, we have Living God Ministries with Aaron Budgen. Then at 3.30, it's In Touch with Charles Stanley. Well, we have a special opportunity right now for you to go see a concert and help build a church at the same time. The multi-award winning acapella group Take Six is doing a benefit concert Saturday, April 6th at Rolling Hills Church. 